Hi, I'm Jonathan Noxer, and this, 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 and this is Super House. Now, if you've set up a security camera as part of your home automation system, you've probably used something like this. It's a Wi-Fi enabled, network connected security camera. All you do is plug in power, connect it to your network, and then away you go. I have cameras like this in a bunch of different places around my house, both inside and outside. If you are just setting up one or two cameras, something like this is fantastic. This is the little Foscam camera, and I've got a bunch of these around the place. I think I've got about five or six installed at the moment, and they're really simple. All you do is apply power to it, and you can either plug in ethernet or connect it up to Wi-Fi, which means you can literally power this up, configure it for your network, and a few minutes later, you can be watching video via this camera. And you can also do port forwarding, so you can connect to it via the internet. But there are limitations. You might have noticed that if you look around commercial premises, they don't have a bunch of these things. These are great if you want one or two cameras around, but you quickly run into limitations. And that's exactly what's happened to me. Firstly, these are fairly old now, so the resolution isn't very good. It's only 640 by 480, which is pretty bad. They're also designed to work as individual cameras. They're not really designed to work as part of a network of multiple cameras. That means if you have a whole lot of cameras, connecting to them can be a real pain. You have to connect to each one individually. Some of these systems do have links within the user interface so that you can see a list of cameras, just click a different camera and you access it. But most of the time, these are good if you just want one or two cameras. If you look at commercial premises, they typically have a different type of camera. They, instead of having all of the intelligence built into the camera itself, because this essentially has little computer inside it, which does the image processing, connects to the network, and allows you to access it. What the um, commercial systems do, the CCTV systems for, um, you know, that you see around shopping centers and that sort of thing, typically the, they do not put too much intelligence into the camera. The cameras themselves send pretty much a raw video signal back to a central location and then there is equipment that can take the inputs from all of those cameras and process them all. It means that it's much easier to store it. In one of my previous videos I showed some of the things I've done to be able to record video from these and store it for future reference. But if you can have a camera or a camera system that supports native recording, it makes things a whole lot easier. So I'm going to try out this new system. I grabbed hold of one of these Anki systems, which is a four camera system. And what this comes with is four HD cameras. So they're 1920 by 1080 resolution and a digital video recorder. The digital video recorder has four inputs. So what you do is connect up the cameras. They all come back to one central location, put a hard disk in this and it will record full HD video from the four video streams. This particular package cost, um, I think it was 360 US, oh, 360 Australian dollars for the digital video recorder and a set of four HD cameras. And there is another version of this from the same company. It's just a slightly different model, which I think is $250 for use in the US. And that's just because um, some of the video standards are different, but it's in the region of $250 to $360 Australian, so less in US dollars for a system with the digital video recorder and the four cameras. So let's look at the differences between them. How a little individual like hobbyist or domestic camera like this connects up compared to a more commercial sort of grade security system. So this is what I got in the package from Anki. I got these four cameras. We'll take a closer look at those in just a moment. Came with some mounting equipment. There is also a power supply. This is quite unusual. It's a, um, a power supply for the cameras and it's got four DC jack outputs. So those go to the four cameras. It's got some cable and um, this is coaxial cable. That's also something different to a typical IP camera. So I'm going to look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. Over here we have the digital video recorder and it even comes with a mouse and a drive cable and we have a power supply for it here. Now this little box is also quite interesting. It's basically a mini uh, Linux PC with some special hardware on it for the video capture. 
If you've used an IP camera before, you're probably quite familiar with this. So this is the classic FOSCAM. It's a gimbal camera, pan tilt mount, so it can rotate and it can look up and down. It's got the antenna there for Wi-Fi. It's got RJ45 socket for a network. It's also got power in on here and there's audio in and out. So you can plug in a speaker and a microphone with this and actually use this to communicate with people. So you can see what's going on and talk to people at the other end. That's the classic self-contained IP camera. So compare that to the Anki, which looks much simpler and it's a fixed position camera. It's in a metal case, so this is actually quite hard. There's a plastic uh, bezel on the front there. They both have infrared illuminators. You can see the ring of infrared LEDs around the actual camera unit. And this one is also designed to be a little bit more robust. The cable comes out through the bottom of the bracket. The idea is that you can screw this on and then the cable is all concealed. It's just a little bit more tamper proof. Of course, it's not gonna stop someone destroying it with a hammer, but it's not quite as easy as one of these where you can just walk on along and unplug the network cable or pull out the power. The other difference you'll see is that this one has the power socket here on the cable. This has the equivalent power socket just in the back of it. But this has a coaxial connector. And that's because the video signal that comes out of this is not a like a packet type um, message like you would find on an IP camera. It's not a TCP IP packet. It is more of a raw video signal that's processed at the other end by the digital video recorder. That means the cable is different. This is a classic piece of twisted pair cable, standard network cable that you would use for an IP camera. Let's have a look at what's inside it, just so that you can see the difference between this and the coaxial cable. If we take the sheath off, we find that there are eight conductors inside and each pair of conductors is twisted together. This is why it's called twisted pair cable. And in fact, you'll notice that some of these are twisted more tightly than others. That's to reduce coupling between pairs. Now let's check out the coaxial cable. Here is a big chunk of coaxial cable. I've cut the end off it, and if you look down the end, you can see that it's almost like a tree trunk. Right in the middle, there is a conductor. Then there is a ring of insulation. Then there is another conductor, which is a shield, and then more insulation. So if you cut across it, you can see that it's actually a series of rings. And the reason it's called coaxial cable is that the axis is the same, or the central axis. So we have a whole series of conductors and insulators all on the same central axis, and they're aligned together. They're not sitting beside each other, they're actually embedded within each other. So let's strip this off a bit and see what's inside. Now I should be using proper coaxial cable stripper for this, but I don't have one handy, so I'm just settling for the brute force, go for the knife method. Now if we take off the outer layer of insulation, you can see that there is the braid inside, and this is the shield. So that's just woven around the outside. And then inside that, if we get the, um, the braid away, in this particular cable there is a, um, a layer of foil. So there is foil and then the insulation braid is wrapped around that. This is pretty good quality cable actually, so there are multiple layers of it. And then inside that, there is some more, then inside that is insulation again, and um, then inside the insulation, if we cut this back, is the central conductor. So right there is the signal carrying conductor. So this is what coaxial cable looks like if you butcher it like I have. Now what I've shown you here is very heavy grade coaxial cable. The cable that's supplied with the Anki system is much lighter weight. It's more appropriate for this sort of application. And um, if we unwrap that, what we can see is that it's actually a dual cable. There is the coaxial cable here, which has the twist connector on the end. And then there is also another conductor. So it's actually like figure eight cable. It's two cables joined together, one of which carries the video signal and one of which carries power. We need to get power to the camera. So if I grab the camera back in here again, we can see that there is the video signal and there's the power. So two camera, this end is the one we want because it's got a plug at one end and a socket at the other. The way you connect it together is you just push it in, you twist the little lock, clips into place, and for power, we plug it in. So that's how the camera connects up to its coaxial cable. Now a coaxial cable is usually a little bit 
more tricky to deal with than twisted pair cable and often you'll buy it with the connectors pre-fitted like this so it's in a standard predetermined length that may not be exactly what you want and um, these cables may not be long enough to suit your particular needs or if they're too long you'll end up with a big bundle at one end somewhere so what you can do is either make your own coaxial cables you can put your own connectors on it or you can use adapters and actually put the same signal over a twisted pair cable even though the cameras weren't designed for this so here we have the big bundle of cable that's supplied with the camera it's got the connectors at each end what we can do instead is replace that with a piece of ethernet cable now obviously this is not going to take the, um, the distance to your camera I'm just using this as an example and then what you can do is use a couple of devices like this and they're a matching pair they go one at each end so what you do is plug one in at your camera end plugs into your regular twisted pair ethernet cable plug one in at the other end in this case we've got this one is the receiver so it goes at the digital video recorder side and this is the camera end what this does is carry the signal across the twisted pair cable so what we have here is equivalent to this cable it provides the connections that are necessary for the camera and it also provides the power pass through so if you have existing ethernet cable in place and you're replacing cameras which I am this is really handy because you can just plug one in at each end use existing cable and you don't need to drag the new cable through this particular one also has pass through for audio so if you wanted to have a microphone at, up where the camera is you could pass the audio signal back over it and monitor it in this particular case I don't have any audio it's just video and power so I'm not going to use this but it means that I can use my existing ethernet cable just plug these in at each end and away we go the very first thing I'm going to do before I try setting up any of the cameras is I have to get the digital video recorder sorted now this doesn't come with a hard disk I need to install my own disk that's one of the reasons they keep the cost so low and it gives you some flexibility you can decide what size disk you want to install I happen to have a bunch of old one terabyte disks lying around they came out of a RAID array that got upgraded one of the things is that the manufacturer recommends that you use a 7200 RPM disk and um, that's because it's got to record four HD video streams you need a reasonably fast disk this is a 7200 RPM disk you can get 5400 RPM disks as well but they're probably not fast enough this one will do the unit itself comes with this SATA cable and mounting screws for the disc so I've just got to pull the, um, the cover off and we'll see how it mounts there we go so now we have our tiny little single board Linux computer with its video acquisition hardware and there is the power cable for the SATA disc looks like this plugs in here and it just screws into the bottom of the case time to get it mounted got some ventilation slots in here as well try to get some airflow through to the disc okay so I'll route the SATA cable over here and that plugs into the SATA port on that tiny little micro motherboard and then I need to put in this power cable I'll just cut off the cable tie there we go plug in the power cable oh yeah, there's a cooling fan here so it will have some cross ventilation going on discs in these sorts of little devices can end up being quite hot because there's not much airflow you don't have a big fan like in a normal computer very good now we have the unit all ready to go let's have a look at the connectors on the back though before I plug it all in here we have the four video inputs so these come from the cameras it's also got audio in and audio out so it has some audio functionality I'm just not sure what yet because that's not built into the cameras there's also an HDMI out and a VGA out so we can plug in a monitor using either of those two there is a network connection there's also a USB port here which we'll use for the mouse and the power input so now we want to connect a camera up to the DVR I'm just going to do it all here on the workbench just to verify that this works this is the power supply that goes to the cameras it's got the four outlets for the four cameras it's already plugged in at the other end and I've got my cable so one end specifically is for it says 2 DVR and on the back here we have these connectors I'm going to 
plug it into one of those connectors. Just push it on and turn the locking collar. That all locks in place. So normally, of course, this would then go through your ceiling or wherever it happens to be to go all the way to the camera. And at the other end, the camera needs to be plugged in. So once again, we plug in the video connector, turn the locking ring, plug in power, and the camera is now ready to go. Finally, one of these power sources from this four-way power block goes to the power input on the cable at the DVR end. That will now be sending power to the camera. It should come to life. And it has, it's come up on channel three. I must've just plugged it into the channel three thing randomly. In fact, we can look at the back of the DVR. There it is. And this is the camera. And in, oh, we can point this at here and we get a bit of an inception thing going on. The camera looking at a camera, looking at a camera. Oh, and look, that's you. There are all the superhumans out on the internet. That's the camera you're looking at this through. Hi. So now we have the security camera connected up and presumably recording. So I want to experiment a little bit and see how we can access recordings and things on the Anki system. So with a little bit of fiddling around, this actually seems fairly intuitive. There are no menus or anything visible on the screen, but if you drag up to the top of one of these, you can see a few icons here. And if you right click, then you can see a whole lot of different things as well. So say we go into search and in here we've got a little timeline, which is quite nice. We can zoom in. So I'll go into 30 minutes. I'll select this section, zoom in. And we can see a timeline and then see what was going on at that point in time. I'll pause that and come forward, further forward in the timeline here. We can also, oh, we can stop it. We can play it backwards. And then there are options here for a sna saving snapshots and setting markers. So it looks like there are quite a few options in here. We can access history in quite a few different ways by time, by file. You can do a single camera view or a multi-camera view. You can specify how you want the cameras laid out. This looks pretty cool. So now that I've proven the basic system is working and the software seems to work okay, I think it's time to install a couple of these cameras and I'm going to compare them to the existing cameras. Get some footage from both the old and the new cameras side by side in real time, see how they compare in different lighting conditions, what the video quality is like. So it's time to get dirty. Whoops, there's been a problem with my cunning plan. So before I decided to put everything permanently in place and run the cables and spend hours doing that, I thought I'd better check out that all the software was working properly. The problem is that this particular system is for remote access needs Windows. It uses ActiveX or some crap like that so that you can just access it in the web browser and then see what's going on. That is a real problem because my plan was to put the digital video recorder in a cupboard, lock it away with the UPS where it's out of the way and where it can't be accessed if anyone breaks into the house. If someone breaks in, I don't want them just taking the DVR and away goes all the evidence of the video. So um, what I was going to do was have a couple of screens around the place logged into the web interface to show the video. What I'd normally do up here is I typically have a few browsers open up on these upper screens showing the video feed from cameras around the place, particularly out the front. But I'm not going to be able to do that. So what I did was I actually installed Windows on my iMac so that I could test whether I could access the system. And so far, I haven't even been able to get Windows to work. So right now, I've got no remote access to this digital video recorder. Now, I think I can probably get it working under Windows. It's meant to work under Windows, but I can't just put a, a screen up on a wall somewhere with a low power PC and display um, you know, live video feed. That really sucks. So I've got to change my plans. What I'm going to do instead is mount this up inside the ceiling and I'm going to have to do something like run a really long um, HDMI cable from here to somewhere that I want to put a screen on the wall. Now, the interesting thing is that when I was doing all of the renovations, I was actually planning to put a PC up inside the ceiling to drive some screens. So there's already a spot up there. It's a nice little platform. It's got a PowerPoint. It's got an Ethernet socket. It's just waiting for something like this. So what I'm going to do is put this up there, run a long cable and mount another screen on the wall. Now, when we looked at the box earlier, you remember there were two video ports on it. There was the HDMI port and also a VGA port. 
I'm really curious to know whether I can plug two monitors into it and have them both work at the same time. What that would mean is I could put a local screen on the box on say the VGA port and then run a really long like a 10 meter HDMI cable to a screen mounted somewhere else in the house. Or I could have two displays basically running off the same box and just with the, um, the single machine I don't need an external computer logged into it over the network. So I'm going to try with two screens on it just to see what happens. And the cool thing is it works. I've got one monitor on HDMI, one on VGA, and they're basically just a mirror. So that's great. It means I can put this up inside the roof. I can mount a monitor nearby and I'll put on something like, I was wondering if I should use a wireless mouse or maybe a really, really long USB lead, but I've got a spare wireless mouse and hopefully the range will be good enough. I'll plug the receiver in, have this up inside the ceiling and then run a cable to a monitor that I'll stick on the wall. So here I am up inside the roof space. This is where I had set up to mount a computer for the status screens. It's perfect for this. So I've got a nice little base here to mount it on. I've got a, uh, a network socket here, a couple of GPOs over here, so I can plug in power. So this is my Freetronics packing area. I normally pack orders just on this shelf here, and I've got products here and more on other shelves, packaging material over here. And what I did was stick this massive old TV up on the wall because I wanted to display orders that needed to be packed. And it turned out to be a bit of a pain. I didn't use it because I needed a computer connected to it all the time, which was always running, took a lot of power. In the end, I got a Microsoft Surface tablet, stuck that up there instead. So that now shows the status of all the orders that need to be packed. The TV has been sitting there for a couple of years without being used. So I'm going to send the camera display down to this TV and up here is where I'm going to mount another monitor. Originally, I was going to use just one of these little monitors that's sitting up on the second row. I normally have security cameras displayed on those. But the thing is, that I've got an old TV that I rescued from hard rubbish and resurrected. So I'm going to put a swing arm mount up on the wall and stick a, the big TV in that area. It's massive overkill, but hey, I've got it. It didn't cost anything, so I can use it for that purpose. And that way I can then put more information up on those other screens. I normally use them for things like stock level and um, you know, network traffic reports and that sort of thing. So it'll free up an extra screen that previously was showing the cameras. Well, a TV is ridiculously big for this application, but it was free, so oh well make it easy to see from anywhere in the room. I've drilled a pretty big hole in here because I'm going to have to feed this cable down from the top and as you can see there's insulation inside the wall so I've got to work around that as well. So I've got this bit of old coat hanger wire going down through the hole in the wall and I'm going to try to find it at the bottom and drag the cable through. What I've done is taped the end of the HDMI cable onto this now, one thing to keep in mind is you can see that I've wrapped this so that there aren't any edges. So if I'm dragging this down, hopefully it won't catch on anything. But you also need to make sure that you cover the back of it. What can be really annoying is if you start dragging a cable down, it gets stuck, you can't get it through, you have to drag it back. But then you have an edge on the back of the connector, and then you try to drag it back out, and it gets stuck on something going the other way as well. So make sure you tape over the cable and whatever you're dragging it with so that it doesn't get snagged. Now I'm down the bottom again. I've got to find that uh, bit of coat hanger that I shoved through. I know I pushed it down far enough because I measured and marked on it. Oh, there it is. Fantastic. Just going to drag it back up, drag it out. And now hopefully I can get the HDMI cable down through here. Now I could just leave that HDMI cable hanging out of the wall, but that'd be ugly. So I'm going to put a nice wall plate on it. I'm going to grab one of these, which is a little HDMI to HDMI jack. And then that mounts inside a wall plate. Should make it much neater. I cut the hole out wider to give some clearance. And I have this plaster mounting bracket that just goes inside here, inside the wall. Little flame just clip over, and as long as it's all in the right place so that the screw holes are exposed, we can now screw a face plate onto that. This is the HDMI pass through adapter. You can see it's got an HDMI socket on the back, one on the front, and it fits into this wall plate. 
So all I need to do is clip it in here, which can be pretty hard. These things are really tight sometimes. I think I've got it. Yep. So now we have an HDMI wall plate and I can feed the HDMI cable back up into the wall, plug it into the top of this little adapter, screw it all in and we'll have a nice neat fitting. Beautiful. Now we can just use a regular short HDMI cable to plug into there and into the back of the monitor. So now that the unit is in place and um, we've got the monitors up, we've got the mouse so we can control it, it's time to run to some cables for some cameras. So luckily this cable has just reached where I need it to go with maybe a meter or two to spare. They're 15 meter cables, which is enough to get a fair distance, but by the time you allow run up, run down, etc., you can quickly go through it. So if your cable isn't long enough, what can you do? Can you just plug another one in? Here I have two of the cable packs that came with the Anki cameras. Each one is 15 meters long. Now, if you look at the ends of the cable, you'll see that one says two DVR and the other end says two camera. That's because they have different gendered power plugs on the ends. One's got a male, one's got a female, but the video connectors are the same on both ends. So what that means is that if you've got two of these cables and you want to just join them together to make them longer, it's easy to jump the power through. They just plug straight in. Problem is that you can't plug the video connections together. They just don't work. What you need to do is get a little barrel adapter that plugs into the middle. It lets you attach these two together and then you've got a cable that's twice as long. I don't have one here to show you, but I'll put a picture of it right here so that you know what I'm talking about. Once you've put that in place, you've basically got a cable that is just 30 meters long instead of 15. Or of course, you could just go out and buy a longer cable. Now after all that preparation, it's finally time to take away a couple of the old Foscam cameras and put in the new Anki cameras. Well that one's physically mounted now. It's pretty easy to screw it in. It's got three holes in the base plate and there's a little route that you can put the cable through so it's pretty easy to get it in. This is the cable for the camera that's mounted on the front of the garage. Just comes straight through the wall here, nice and handy. So all I have to do is plug it in. That's it, done. Hey, we're making some good progress now. Three of the four cameras are connected. We have a look here at the monitor. You can see I've got the driveway. There's a view from the garage that I just put up. There's also the back of the house. And if I use the remote control to close the garage door, you'll see the garage door moving on the camera there. And if we look through here, there it is. The garage door is closing. So we have three or four done. The thing is though that what I want to do for the for camera two, it's actually going to be the trickiest one. That's the one that's out near the front door. Currently has an IP camera on it and I want to replace it with an Anki camera. But it's too far for the cable and I want to try using the uh, Cat5 adapter and uh, we'll see how it works over Ethernet cable. Hey, so we're almost done now with what's turned out to be a bit of an epic video. I've dragged through Ethernet cable. This goes through to the, um, the camera that's at the front door. And I've already got it plugged in with the adapter at the other end. So what I have here is the UTP to um, coax adapter. I'll just plug that in. Now I need to plug this into the video input on the DVR. Plug in power. And we can see if we get a signal from the camera. So as you can see, we have success. Video from the front door is now visible up here. Now for comparison purposes, I also have the video here from the IP camera. What I did was attach the new camera right next to the old camera. So we've got both the old feed and the new feed. And this is downscaled and um, 
this is the original full resolution video. So in fact, this would be full screen, fantastic quality. It just looks so much better than the old camera. Uh, now it's not really a fair comparison because this is an old camera and this is a brand new one. So it's 640, 480 resolution versus 1920 by 1080. But still you can see it's a dramatically better picture. So I'm gonna take away the old camera now. Uh, now this video is already heaps longer than I expected it was going to be. I had a whole list of extra things I wanted to show you. For example, I wanted to show how to use a Sonoff to control power to the monitor so that when I walk into the room, the home automation system can detect me and turn on the monitor and then turn it off again when I leave the room just to save power. I also wanted to show how to distribute video from the DVR using something like a wireless sender so that I can then send the video from the cameras to other TVs around the house and do that in a secure way so that I can just pull up the cameras when I'm sitting at the TV. And um, there are a whole bunch of extra features in the software. For example, it's a windy day at the moment and you can see out here this little person moving. That's because the camera has figured out that there is motion in this field of view. The trees out the front here are being blown around a little bit. So you can do motion detection and you can even set up specific zones so you can exclude areas from the video. But I don't have time to get into any of that because this video is already way too long. I'd also really wish that I got an eight camera system instead of four camera because I still have a bunch of IP cameras around the place. I just don't have enough with the four channel system. So an eight channel system would have been much better for me. But it looks like I'm gonna to have to do another follow up video. There's a whole lot more to talk about. So in the meantime, well, I should give a summary. Do I like the system? I find it really annoying that I can't access it via the network from Mac or Linux and that only Windows can be used to access it. That's a real shortcoming. Um, but apart from that, I really like it. I love the fact that the quality is so good that it just records in HD continuously and it scrubs the old recordings. I can go back and search through it. The user interface is actually pretty good. It's a, quite a usable system. Overall, would I buy again? Yes, I would, but I think I'd buy the system with at least eight channels. So um, if you're looking for a DVR um, and home security video system, this is certainly a system that's worth looking at. So until next time, go and build something awesome. See ya.